everyone, and welcome to episode 721 of Longbox Heroes, the Lamborghini of comic book podcasts. Joe and Todd here. Todd, hello. How are you? I'm doing great, Joe. Ready to do a, a low-key podcast about comics. Right. Uh, do you have your heart pills nearby, just in case? I, I bought extra. Oh, okay. The doctor prescribed me extra this week. Uh, he knew. He knew. The bottle says one one at a time, but in this case, Todd, <laughs> you're allowed two. That That is true. And uh, I'm not going to say what doctor prescribed them, Joe. <laughs> uh, but does he wear a bow tie? No. This is is he from the Hershey area? <laughs> he has a medical bag, a nice medical bag he takes everywhere. Did uh, did you send him a late night text on Saturday night that just said Todd needs his candy? <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> oh boy! All right, well listen, uh, we're tiptoeing around it here, but uh, hey, there was a lot of stuff announced at San Diego Comic Con this past weekend. Sure was. Yeah, like a lot actual comic book news, mm-hmm. um, big things on both the Marvel and DC sides of films. Hmm. And we're going to get into as much of it as we possibly can. Of course, we're going to miss some things, uh, I'm sure. Um, We're going to take a walk down one of the alleys of Lois Lane (laughs) and talk about one of the uh, 40s romance comics that Becky loves so much. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about what we read from this past week, which is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 from IDW and Nice House by the Sea. From DC Comics, spiritually, it's a Vertigo book. And we'll get my decision on how I'm going to end up reading this book. The answer probably won't surprise you. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to do Todd and Joe Have Issues, where we're going to finish up the second story arc in Gail Simone's Secret Six. And I have no choice but to say a spoiler-filled discussion of Deadpool Wolverine. Right. Listener beware, I'll do my best to put a time code stamp something Mm -hmm. uh, in the show notes. If you by now have not seen Deadpool Wolverine or not had everything spoiled on you, uh, I'll I'll hopefully put like a last uh, ditch thing in there for you, right? Right, right. Uh, So again, uh, so I will say, um, you know, I would would never take credit for talent. Uh, Talent gets by... Uh, by their own accord, we are a show that just recognizes talent. Mm-hmm. What I would say on the comic book side of things, Gail Simone was probably, if not the, one of the biggest winners of San Diego Comic-Con. True. True. Uh, obviously, she gets to do a bunch of stuff with the Marvel coming up, Uncanny X-Men number one. Uh, but she had two new books announced uh, this upcoming, uh, or this past week. That are going to be coming out where she, Gail Simone, is going to be writing James Bond over at Dynamite. Mm-hmm. And she is also going to be writing She Spawn at Image. Right. And listen, I, we've talked before, and, you know, if you listen to Previewing the Past, you know, you'll hear me say that, like, after the initial Image boom, Spawn was a book that I stayed on, I would probably think, until, like, 2003, 2004, maybe. Right. Um, that was the one that held my interest the most. And I'm still waiting for that Jimmy Palmiotti gunslinger spawn book to come out. Right. Right. Me too. And I'm not in listen. Spawn is currently on an uptick. They just announced that Blumhouse is going to be making a new spawn movie. Um, but I will absolutely read a Gail Simone. She spawn book. Um, and I will say, I'll probably try it. I'm not, a, I was never a spawn guy unless, you know, with some of the weird, uh, fill in writers over the years, but I'll be all over a uh, Gail Simone James Bond book. Right. I dabble in the the James Bond stuff by different writers and stuff. So when I found out she was doing, it, I was like, hmm, this has me shaken and stirred, Joe, waiting for this book. <laughs> so, um, speaking of Dynamite, though, they did also announce uh, that they are going to be doing a new Ducktales book here uh, by the end of the year. And they're also going to be doing a Thunder the Barbarian book. I, I, I'm surprised when I when this came out. Like I was like Thunder the. It's about time. Do you know there's never been a Thunder comic show? No, I'm not. Uh, did nope. remember when DC had the Hanna Barbera properties for a little bit? Yep. 
didn't wasn't there a book like a team up book that Thunder or the Barbarian or like ancillary characters showed up in that? I, I think there was ancillary characters, but I don't think there's ever been a Thundar like Thundar has never been in comics anywhere. That's crazy uh, to think about. Right. And a lot of the stuff was created by Jack Kirby. And I don't know if you know this. A lot of comic people like Jack Kirby. Um, so I figured that along the way, and this was one of the best like cartoons of my youth because it was so different than anything that was going on. I love Thundar. And I think that was another book that was in the far flung future of 1998 or something like that. Um, but it was just so cool. Ookla, uh, was made because the creators, one of them liked UCLA. That was one of the things that I always loved, but never in a, cause I've looked, I've always thought that it was prime for, a comic adaptation. We've had like Space Ghost. We've had all like you know uh, all the other ones, but ne- never Thunder the Barbarian. So uh, Thunder the Barbarian is one of those uh, cartoons, and you'd mentioned uh, uh, Jack Kirby, but Steve Gerber was also involved with it as well. Very weird cartoon, man. Right, very weird. Um, you know, and it's one of those co- cartoons that if you had asked me how many episodes there were of it. Mm-hmm. On how often it ran, I would have said there was like 200 episodes. And I would have said like there's 20. Right. I think there's 50. Right. Um, and you mentioned the time frame. So um, <laughs> events of what happened in 1994 is what predicates what goes on in Thunder the Barbarian, which takes place in the year 3994. Oh, okay. That's what it was in right. every year. That, but 1994 so you know was in there, right? That's a far flung future. I'm cool with that. I'm sorry. Yes, um, but I I am uh, intrigued by a Thunder of the Barbarian comic book. This is definitely one I will give that first pass to. But it's just an announcement. No creative teams. No dates. No nothing like that. But uh, you know, if, I think if you like this show, you probably have some sort of affinity one way or the other for Thunder the Barbarian. And it's one of those things where Thunder the Barbarian came on either right before or right as He-Man was hitting. Right. And obviously there's a lot of thematic elements to both. Mm-hmm. And sadly, like He-Man was like a slicker, flashier toys in the shelf product. Right. And Thunder sadly went away shortly Listen, after like the first 64 episode run of He-Man was done. I'll say this. Time, time hasn't made the judgment yet. There's still time. We have until the year 3000 to figure out what's going on. Joe. Right. 3994 to be exact. But yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Marvel and, you know, a lot of the DC comic stuff came out pre San Diego um, you know, nothing really, def- you know what, there actually was a bunch of, um, announcements that came out, but it's nothing as part of, like, the first wave of the Absolute. Mm-hmm. Like, we have, uh, Ram V is doing a New Gods book, uh, Jeff Lemire is doing Absolute Flash, and he's taking over JSA after Jeff Johns is done. Mm-hmm. Um, I- and there was a bunch of others, but I think those were the biggies, at least, you know, for us. Yeah, so Joe... Will Jeff Johns' JSA be done before Lemire's book hits the street? Does Lemire's book have a street date? November? I don't think it's November. I don't think it is. I know, if I remember correctly, his flash isn't until February. Okay. Let me see if I could find it here. I thought Jeff Lemire... Uh, let me look at his, his newsletter thing. Uh, two series. Oh yeah. JSA is going to be November. You are right. Will, will Jeff Johns uh, thing be done by then? Nope. (laughs) You don't think so? Nope. I don't know. And by the way, there was 21 episodes of Thunder the Barbarian over two seasons. There you go. 21. Oof. (laughs) I knew when I said 20, I was close, but. Yeah. Look at me. I'm on I'm on point this episode. Yeah, a lot of wins for Todd so far. Let's uh, mm-hmm. put an end to that, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's streak. We'll see how long it goes. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, there's no chance the Jeff Johns book is done by the time that comes out for November. You know what? I think it's going to be. I think they're going to push Jeff at that other company. He's going to be like, I'm going to put all that creator-owned stuff on the side, get those two issues out for you. I don't even need to do that because that's going to well, it's too. Di- it's going to be two different books. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I'm like, I have to update the spreadsheet when I go home to put you know that on there for November, even though it's not in the solicitations yet. And I'm like, oh, no, I already have JSA on my list. This technically is just going to be a continuation of this. But there's going to be a period of time where there's two JSA books that are currently going on at DC. The last issue of Jeff John's run and the first issue of Jeff Lemire's run. You don't have your on your spreadsheet books by volume when they're like, like when, they, they, you know, when books have names that have been used before you know what i mean that's for the spreadsheet for the boxes that's not for the okay. spreadsheet for the pull list because very rarely do two volumes overlap yes this will be one of those rare instances where they do okay um and then marvel uh at their comic book side uh you know they had a bunch of announcements and stuff like that just you know Um, But nothing really that hit us, I think. You know, I think they said that there's going to be, like, a new Fantastic Four team. Right. Like, new members of the Fantastic Four. And they, you know, and again, they teased it at the San Diego Comic-Con panel. Um, It's teased at the end of this week's Blood Hunt. So, you know, we're not going to give too, too much away because the book's not even out yet. But we'll just say what they said at San Diego, that the next big crossover event for Marvel is a Doctor Doom centric event called One World Under Doom. I'm down with that title, Joe. Yeah. So I'm going to be buying a lot of books, apparently. <laughs> um, but DC on the on the movie side, you know, we had talked about it here for weeks and weeks. There was rumor and innuendo in regards to uh, something changing at DC, a big change. Back to a better day, some would say, not me. Um, but DC officially, with the release, I guess, of Creature Commandos from Jimmy Pistol, uh, everything go, and I assume maybe with absolute stuff, that they're going back to the old bullet logo for the DC comics. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, of course, like Jimmy Pistol's wearing the shirt and it has the 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 old bullet logo and it says studios underneath. Right. They need to sell a shirt that just has the logo on it and doesn't say studios underneath. They probably will. Uh, DC well, over the last, oh boy, um, let's say 13 years, uh, has been really bad at direct market sales of their merchandise, like shirts and stuff. I, I'll agree with that. Yeah. But there, I'm wholeheartedly believing that if Jimmy Pistol's behind, like part of the push on this, you're going to get those shirts. I because, want that shirt. Because they did, the thing that they did, and I was mad that I wasn't at San Diego this year just for that, um, was the pin set that they did. Oh, of course. Gorgeous. You and your you and your pins. Oh, pins. They did a DC bullet with the DC, bu- just the bullet, and then the DC uh, Studios bullet one. So, yeah, I have a feeling you will get that shirt because they're going to market the bejesus out of that, Joe. I hope so. And eventually... Me and the other two people that like the tweet when the the star swoosh comes back into vogue. <laughs> right. Uh, I will say this, though, Joe. You, we, we've argued this many times on the show, which was the best symbol for the DC books. And I think if your your boy, Jimmy Pistol, is is pushing that, I think I won this feud, I'm going to say. Well, it's, and again, it's not so much as a feud. I like the DC bullet. Right. But I just thought that that logo that they introduced in like 05, 06 Mm -hmm. was stylish. It looked different. It was something cool that they could kind of animate in a way, which they did at the front of a lot of the shows and movies at the time. And I think they gave up on it too quickly to go to like the Peel logo, which stinks. Right. And I would never say that I don't like the bullet. The bullet is classic. The bullet is classic. The bullet is my DC logo growing up and everything else like that. I just, you know, if we're going to go to something a little bit newer, I'd like something newer. But the DC bullet is back. How can I miss you if you don't go away? Right? (laughs) Right. Fair enough. But I will absolutely acquiesce this one to you as well and say this is another one. Todd was right. (sighs) 
I'm just racking up the W's. Yeah, you, you sure are. So Marvel's big Hall H announcement. Is that what it is? Hall H? I think so. Their big Hall H announcement was 2020 whatever, 25, 26, I think 26. The previously titled Avengers Kang Dynasty has been retitled as Kang or Ave- I still want Kang to be involved. Has been retitled as Avengers Doomsday. And I'm like Oh, baby, I'm licking my chops. It's the Marvel DC crossover we've all been waiting for. Doomsday is coming. And then something else happened. Todd? All right. Let me just take my inhaler. (sighs) Okay. So they announced that, you know, Kang's going away, which I'm fine with. And Doom is going to be the big baddie. And then they end up announcing that Doom will be played by... Robert Downey Jr. And they said Victor Von Doom. So they didn't say a Tony Stark variant. And I was destroyed. This was such, this is such a terrible idea. This is everything wrong. This is a giant dump truck full of money up to Downey Jr. to get this to happen. They got the Russos involved. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're killing me. Because, and in our Discord, I saw a couple, a couple of people chime up, I'll, I'll, I'll name names, like, Tim's like, oh, this is awesome. And I'm like, yes, be, you, people love it, because they love Robert Downey Jr. Robert yes. Downey Jr. is back, and that's what they want. And that's great. That's great. But my take on this is, you, you are giving the Downey Jr. rub to a character that does not need the, the, the Downey Jr. rub. He is maybe the greatest villain in the history of comics. Definitely the greatest villain at Marvel. Um, and you don't need it. So now, however he plays it, if he doesn't play it straight, if he plays it with the Downey char- uh, you know, charisma and he doesn't do straight Victor Von Doom, I hate Reed, like all that stuff, like the, the egomaniacal, like uh, f- talking in third person. That's what people, that's the definitive Dr. Doom from here on out. It's going to be the Robert Downey Jr. And it has me thinking in my life now, I will never get a comic book accurate Dr. Doom. And I just have to accept that now. That being said, he could play it any different way. He could do it however. And I may, you know, it may be good, but I just, I just think it's the wrong thing. And I was a middle of the road Kang guy. And because Kang failed and they had to replace it with this, they should have gave the downy rub to to Kang instead of Dr. Doom because he could have used it. And now I'm in the hate Kang group because of this. This is a debacle. Yeah, I blame Kang. I I blame's going all over the place, but I blame uh, whoever the actor was and Kang and everybody else. Yeah, Majors. Um, Lee Majors or whoever it was, uh, and I'm just like, give me, just give me proper Doctor Doom. Maybe that'll happen. That was my in, in like initial thing. Then when I calm down, I'm like, oh, maybe there's a way around this, and we're gonna get real Doom somehow. And they're hinting at it as possible. But man, oh man, uh, I was sleep. I fell asleep the day that was announced. I think that was like the Saturday at San Diego. It was Con- Saturday night, yeah. And I wake up to my phone, like Discord messages, a couple other people texting me, and I'm like, what is go Joe, what a terrible way to wake up from a nap. That's all I'm gonna say. You were the grieving widow. Yes, yes. So I I'm, I'm gonna address some of the points that you had mentioned here, but the one point that I wanted to mention was, you know, Robert Dowdy Jr. had said, like, I'm done playing Iron Man. Mm-hmm. I'm done with the Marvel Universe. I'm done doing these things. I want to go do something else, right? Real movies, as he said. Right. Uh, But I do have an interview clip here with Robert Downey Jr., how this all came to pass. Whether he mortgaged his house one time, two times, maybe three times, 
came up with the right figure for Steve Austin. All right, we had to cut it there. The Marvel mortgaged their house three times to get Robert Downey Jr. to come back. That I clip will, popped like four people. Right, but I will say this. I almost sent you the audio of Camp Krusty because that's <laughs> the one I've been playing for everybody. Yeah. I'm not made of stone, you know? So I never thought of they could have pivoted and had it revealed that Robert Downey Jr. is going to be the new Kang, right? Mm -hmm. He ends up being Kang Prime, Prime, whatever. Right. Of everything that's already been established in the movie, TV stuff, right? Right. You already have comic book stuff that's built in that there is a timeline where Iron Man, Tony Stark is Kang, or Kang is Tony Stark, whatever. Right. Right. And then you lead into, what was it, Iron Lad. Right. So you can have a young Tony Stark for the Young Avengers. But go ahead, right. sorry. So you have that. It's already built in. You could build off of that, right? And obviously, everything that happened with Jonathan Majors, Disney, understandably, doesn't want anything to do with them. Having them be the linchpin, uh, the anchor character, if you will. Mm-hmm. Of this next phase of their cinematic universe. And I get it. I understand. It's not my decision to make. It's not my decision to, to lay judgment or whatever it is. But now the fact that they go back to the old standard of what worked before in Robert Downey Jr. And now they're going to, one, have to fit this into the story arcs. Now people are going to say and have said, well, they've done this before. In Marvel Comics, they've done the thing where, you know, what if Doctor Doom was Iron Man? Or what if Tony Stark was Doctor Doom? Or whatever, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I know our good friend Josh from the comic book store, uh, he mentions the Bendis, Maleev, infamous Iron Man run, right? Right. But again, that's a little bit different. That's not what this is. But you get, and like, a lot of the other ones were what ifs, or imaginary tales, or alternate realities, or whatever. Then... I don't know who the writer of it is, but he's writing, like, the Ultimates, Ultimates book, right? right? And he had said at one of the Marvel panels that within the next month, in Ultimates, it's going to be explained as to why Robert Downey Jr. Tony Stark is going to be Iron Man, or going to be Doctor Doom in the movies, okay? Right. So now, they have to reshape the future going forward of making it make sense that Tony Stark is Doctor Doom, mm -hmm. and so much so, probably, that he's been Doctor Doom this whole time. It could be, but like they said there, because they're not saying that he's Tony Stark. Like they, they were like, we're introducing our new Doctor Doom, Victor Von Doom. They're not saying our, like, Tony Stark as Doctor Doom. So I'm like I think this is going to be even more confusing when we get there. Do you know what I mean? Like, but I just think the masses are going to lap up that Robert Downey Jr.'s back. Well, whatever they give him, they won't care. And and that's the thing. You and I are going to go see that movie regardless. Mm -hmm. There definitely has been over the last three years, let's say, Marvel movie fatigue. Mm -hmm. When I mentioned this to my wife, when I mentioned this to my brother, when I mentioned this to people who do not read comic books on a daily, if not weekly basis, they thought this was awesome. Right. And those are the people that they're trying to get to come back mm -hmm. to watch those movies. And if putting Robert Downey Jr. in as the new Doctor Doom is going to do it, we're going to do it and we're going to figure out why it makes sense later. Yep. But, and I still stand by, I know, just to go back to a little bit, that it, could, he could have been Kang. He should have been Kang. I just, I know I'm, I'm, I'm rehashing here, but I had some ideas that he, he, he could have done it. And he could have been the one that was embarrassed of the Kang that got beaten by, uh, by Ant-Man. Do you know what I mean? Like, make him a true bad guy. And I think Downey could have played that off. But no, we have to ruin Todd's next decade and a half. Anyway. You'll always have your memories, Todd. I'll always have the Corman Doom, which is still going to be probably the best Doctor Doom, Joe. <laughs> what can Robert Downey Jr.'s Doctor Doom do to 
curry your favor. Okay, one, never take the mask off, which I think he'd be just a voice. I think he'd be happy just to chair act, as you've said. Mm -hmm. Do the accent and just be an egotistical jerk. Like, never do I want to know. Like, for all intents and purposes, if you didn't tell me it was Robert Downey Jr., I wouldn't have known. And I think that's going to be the big opportunity they lay on everybody. They're going to, they're just paying Robert Downey Jr. to stay at home. And then they're going to get an actor just to do it. And they'll be like, oh, it was Robert the whole time. And you, everybody loved it. And then I'll be like, yes, just give me Lat- the Latvarian Lothario, Dr. Doom. Um, but positive, um, I think with this happening means that we will see an influx of Dr. Doom merchandise to the mass market. Right, that I don't have to buy because it'll all be Downey Jr. related. Will it, though? Some of it will be. Like, they will push it on the merch, like the comic book side. Uh, but you you know when it comes around, it's all going to be tiered to whatever his armor looks like. Sure. And what I don't think it's going to make- be... Comic. What if they make his armor the most thematically accurate armor that there's ever been? That I would love, but I don't see it happening. Okay. I think it's going to look more like the guy from Flash Gordon who falls on the the, the spikes. Oh, uh, Ming's crony with the gold yeah. face. Yeah. Yep, yep, which was just ripped off from Doctor Doom as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I'm glad you had a, a, a an opportunity to hold that in for... Mm-hmm. Three days plus. I told everybody I'm saving it for the show when they yeah. ask. Everybody, make sure you make sure you let them know. Mm-hmm. I'll send them all a link when it goes live. There you go. Uh, speaking of links, you could also send them over to soon to be named network.tumblr.com. Uh, anytime any of the shows in the soon to be named network go live, you could find them at their own individual websites you can find them through the podcatcher of your choice but of course they're all going to be at the one stop shop for all the shows and that's soon to be named network.tumblr.com and that of course is this show longbox heroes after dark puzzle warriors 3 profane arguments wings on wings porch talk we need wrestling final wrestling place and at odds with wrestling also in the show notes to every single one of these episodes, you're going to find uh, some of our friends and the stuff that they're up to in and around the world of uh, comics and other related things. Uh, go check out our friend Mike Sterling's blog over at ProgressiveRuin.com. Uh, go check out our friend Kevin's blog over at HellionsTeam.com. Go check out Rick Williams' The Chop Shop at FreeKarateChops.StoreEnvy.com. Uh, he's got a bunch of like cool, like, resin figures and pins and stickers all based on like sci-fi fantasy. They kind of look like the old school muscle figures, you know, uh, go check out Jason Sandberg's Jupiter still available overhead is Indiegogo, uh, buy it a la carte, get all the accoutrements with it, support friends of the show. Uh, another friend of the show, Chris Runt, go purchase his self-published book, Battle Monsters, over at FortressOfComicNudes.com. Go check out our friend Davey's publishing stuff of his own at CaveDomainComics.com. He needs some cross-synergy there with the music as well, unless he's trying to keep all that separate. I don't know. He probably is. Hmm. He doesn't want the con like like how I mentioned on After Dark this week, like when my real world pursuits cross over with Dabbleverse pursuits. Mm-hmm. God forbid somebody who listens to uh, Cave People also reads Dave's comics as well. Right. Yes. And uh, if you have a comic book store, if you do not have a comic book store in your area, or you do not have a good comic book store in your area, let our store be your store. Comics on the Green. We have the Facebook page linked up here. Uh, Anytime the books are in, they're going to give you a ringy dingy on a Wednesday. Uh, When those final order cutoff dates are for the next hottest books are, they'll give you a little reminder there as well. And they'll show you the wares of... Key Silver Age mint condition books that get dropped off on Dave's doorstep almost on a semi-regular basis. They'll mm-hmm. put pictures of all those sort of things up there as well. You can sign up for the mail order subscription service, get books mailed to you weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And if you do, there's a chance you can get a sketch on the package from our good friend Becky, who we're going to turn things over to now for my walk down Lois Lane. 
Welcome back. So we're going to take another break from Lois, and we're going to talk about a comic purely because I want to tell you guys about my friend Irma, but I found this, and now I'm down this rabbit hole, and all of you must come with me. For those who don't know what my friend Irma is, she was a 1940s radio show, a TV show, a newspaper strip, and then a comic by Stan Lee, Dan DiCarlo, and Stan G. Yes, that is the Millie the Model crew, again, full circle. But before we get to her, let's talk about another dizzy all-American blondes that the team worked on. My Girl Pearl, say that five times fast, started as an Atlas comic in April of 1955 and stars 20-year-old Pearl Dimley. She is a nice house with nobody home. She is the dullest crayon in the box, and anyone who interacts with her for the first time is rightfully frustrated. The other city folk who know her find her sweet and naive personality quite charming, and the comic is just gag after gag about how she's dumber than a bag of rocks and it makes people crazy. Some of the characters who make sure that she doesn't die from forgetting to breathe are her boss, Mr. Worley, and his nerdy son, Marvin, who has a thing for her and constantly asks her to marry him, her roommate, Nan, and Nan's boyfriend, Ronald, police officer, Humali, who tries to keep her out of trouble, and her boyfriend, Flash. Flash asks her out in issue one after spending 15 minutes being frustrated by her in his taxi cab, and most of the time he looks like he's going through it, just trying to do the smallest things with her. Other notable characters are Daphne, the boss's assistant who openly dislikes Pearl because she's so stupid but still gets ahead in life, and her twin sister Cheryl, who's identical but intelligent. Because this was Dan DiCarlo's art, Pearl looks like Betty Cooper, ponytail and all, with Flash looking like an adult Archie Andrews. That paired with Stan's constant jokes make it surprising that this book only ran for a sparse 11 issues. Four issues in 1955, two in 1957, three issues in 1960, and two in 1961. My friend Irma ran consistently from 1951 to 1955, with the final issue in February of that year, and then with Pearl premiering of in April of 1955. This comic is just... Atlas couldn't publish the rights to Irma anymore, but still wanted the sales from a dumb blonde comic, and recycled a lot of Irma's jokes. One even has an identical cover. If you find one, grab it. It's funny, but I will admit, I read the issues, and as much as I love the humor, after the third issue of Pearl not playing with a full deck, I began to get a little frustrated <laughs> with myself and for the characters. So tune in next week for some more. Thank you very much, Becky, of course. I, I had a feeling we weren't going to be talking about Lois this week, but, you know, it all is under the same umbrella. Um, I, I do love those old timey romance comics mm -hmm. of the people that are involved um, in those comics. You know, it's the, the same people who did Millie, the model who would go on to do Millie, the model. They right. cut their teeth <laughs> on uh, my girl Pearl, you know? Right. Uh, I I'll tell you with all this, I need a scorecard. Cause like she's dropping my girl, Pearl, my friend Irma. I think up next, she has Clyde, the glide Drexler. I'm just like all these names are like, I, I'm getting a bit confused, but it's all informative as it goes, you know, and I, I love it. So, yes. Thank you, as always, Becky, for these uh, these segments on the show. And uh, Todd, from what we read this past week, where would you like to begin? Um, I'd like to start with the book we were both looking forward to, which was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 by Jason Aaron, art by uh, Joelle Jones. Uh, the issue starts out with uh, we find out that Raphael is in this prison for some reason, and uh, there's like a uh, an escape attempt, and he ends up stopping them. And through it, we're getting like through the narration in his head of what kind of happened, and he we end up that he finding out that he has some sort of deal with the warden. And, uh, and, and this is one that I'm kind of gray on. I think that he is there for a reason, but he's also running the deal with the warden. And, uh, he, he's like, I, and I'll explain it all when it, when it's over. And then a series of events come that may trip all that up for him because the, the foot clan comes to town at the, the prison and it's not for what he thinks it is. And now he may be in some trouble 
when it when it comes to that. And we also don't know how or why the turtles have been split up. We got a little bit of who was it, Donatello in the in the free comic book day one. Yes. And now I think we're going to get like it dished out where where they're all at. And then it's a come together story is kind of the way I gather what he's doing. But I really enjoyed it because it was <clears throat> it was told really well. He started strong because Roth is pretty much my favorite turtle after Casey Jones. Um, so uh, I thought that was really cool. And I like the fact that they have him, you know, as the angry guy and, and all that stuff. It, it's a, It's got a very mirage feel to me but uh, like a fresh take on it and i don't feel lost because it's obviously in the idw universe which there's like i don't know a a lot of like stuff that's happened in that so they're 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 explaining it out as we go and i think that's a a good thing because i don't feel lost even though i haven't read 150 issues of idw turtles yeah and you know i i think it's crazy to think that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a, a comic that essentially was an indie comic that was published out of the house of two guys, you know, um, not only blew up to be not only a multimedia sensation, but a multimedia sensation that is still going strong to, the, to this day and a multimedia sensation alongside a Star Wars or a Marvel comics where even if you've never read or watched, or whatever. Ninja Turtles is so much part of the zeitgeist of pop culture, you know it. I I agree. And and that's really cool, you know, if we've mentioned that on the show before, of course, but it bears repeating. I really like this issue a lot. A lot happens in this issue, but because Jason Aaron very clearly is a fan of the material, source material, the characters and everything like that, you are given enough threads that it doesn't feel overwhelming because you may not be familiar with whatever this iteration of the Turtles are, this iteration of Raphael is, you are familiar with the concept of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which, again, is a crazy thing to think about, right? Right. He's hitting all the beats, at least. Yeah. And... You know, there's uh, there's this uh, the way that it's set up in the beginning where it makes you think it's one guy who's talking about being in the joint in San Quentin and then it shifts to being about Raph, um, how Raph is kind of picked on and bullied. And, you know, he's Raph. So, of course, he no sells it. Mm-hmm. Um, the bit where he realizes that the new inmates that came in are ninjas and how he prepares with just, you know, general stuff around the prison for the battle that he knows that he eventually is going to have to have. And you had mentioned before, did you mention before that um, he and the warden had the secret pact? I say had yes. in the past tense. Yes. yes. Yeah. That, it that does, they had it, the secret pact. And I'm like, oh, there's a mystery here too, right? So there's a lot going on in this first issue, but it is by no stretch of the imagination um, overwhelming. And last time, unless... Todd and I mentioning right now at this very moment the words Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the first time you've ever heard them. Could be. There might be one or two out there, Joe, that right. are on Mars. <laughs> uh, but definitely, I, 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 and we're p- genetically predisposed to like a Jason Aaron book because he does write very good comics. Um, I like the little bit, the Donatello bit that we got. I like the Raph stuff. I have a feeling the other turtles are going to be in similar situations that fit their particular archetype, I guess. Yeah. Um, And then once the, you know, and it's all building up to that moment where the team gets back together. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's a very well-structured comic, a very easy to read comic, a very enjoyable comic, highly recommended. Right. Agree. Uh, so the other book that we're most looking forward to, I would say equally looking forward to, but we both read it as well, uh, was Nice House by the Sea, uh, written by James Tinney the Fourth, with art by Alvaro Martinez Bueno. Uh, mm-hmm. This is the sequel to Nice House by the Lake. Um, obviously, we go from the lake to the sea, so everything is kind of amped up. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You ha- do you had do you need to have read the first book, Nice House by the Lake, to read this? I don't think so. 
I don't think so either. And I think that's a very strong selling point of this. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of those things that I was a little worried about that it was going to lean so heavily on the events of the first series that this new series was going to be almost impenetrable. But essentially what it is, is Max, who's an alien, where they kind of make it clear is otherworldly right from the rip, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of sets the tone a little bit differently than the first series, He gets the people and he puts them together in the house. But this time, from the previous time, it just seemed like regular folks. This time, it seems like Max went out and purposely went and got like the best of the best in their particular fields. Right. So there are clues given that this may not be the first time that Max has done this. Mm hmm. But this is definitely not the first time that Max has done this. I do have to derail you a little bit, though. Go for it. Um, Max is not the guy from the first issue. From the no, f- from the first series? No, no, that was Walter. This oh, is a different right. guy, and he oh. even mentions that they know Walter. Okay, my bad. Thank you. So that I'm just getting that straight. So Max sets up his own house, and Walter set up his own, and they kind of like. Uh, he's he's even mentioned, and I think in this kind of a deal, but uh, I, I do get a little conf- uh, uh, confused on it. So, but I do think Max is completely different than Walter. So right, and that's that's my, that's my bad. I'm thinking that he's using an alias, but you're saying that Max refers to Walter as a separate person. That makes sense, even further still that these aliens, whatever are doing these separate experiments with these different groups of people. Mm -hmm. Max, obviously, as we mentioned, is getting the best of the best. He's giving them a little bit more to do, or at the very least, the best of the best people are able to figure out with the tools that they're being given. They do body modification, age modification, make themselves younger, healthier, etc., um, we do have the one person in the group, Oliver, who is going to be like, I guess, our protagonist throughout all of this. Right. He's going to he's like the driving force, um, you know, so much so that the guy who Max has in charge of everything, Hector, you know, he knows what's going on, but doesn't really know what's going on. But he's in charge of, like, controlling everything for Max and the group. And right. there's a bit in there where one of the characters wanted a thunderstorm, but the other one wanted to enjoy the nice day. Um, there's questions and concerns in and amongst the group of quab- quibbling over how far is too far regarding the age and body modifications. Um, and then, you know, obviously we get a thing that happens on the last page that kind of, you know, sets things in motions going forward. Right. Um, but again, outside of a little bit of confusion over Max and Walter, but again, that's on me. Um, at least that's my guess because when that person shows up and starts doing the wacky stuff like the person's on the boat and is like do you want to take the short way back or the, the long way back and he's like oh it's the short way and they have like a weird look and like they have the glasses kind of like Walter had and I can't find the name Max in any of the they have the list of people who are being in the house and Walter shows up in a flashback from the book. So, and at one point in the book, they kind of, which was kind of my prediction from the first uh, nice house by the lake where they're talking to like, well, you know, what if, you know, we're not the best of the best. Cause that's kind of what they're doing. And they say, well, I guess then the other, one of the other houses will win. And I was setting up that I do believe that it wasn't the only, and there may be multiple. And right. I feel like that this is that there was that movie where they all went to the Island It's like that famous and they have to like kill each other until there's like a few left. Um, And that's kind of like the, 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 the formula that a lot of people have used over the years. And I feel that's what this is, but I will say, I felt that we didn't have to read a nice house by the lake, which I constantly want to call that this because my brain is programmed to say that. Yeah. Um, But I feel that this was very more easily easier to get into they ran it wasn't a confusing they ran through each person real quick i got the 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 brief explanation and i don't know if it's because i read nice house by the lake or he did it better in this one um i'm not sure but i like that we get right to the meat and the potatoes of this and i'm not you know 
trying to figure out the mystery, if that makes any sense. Right. And I think we maybe take for granted having read Nice House by the Lake, reading Nice House by the Sea, we can say, oh, you don't need to read the first one. Mm -hmm. But we already have it in our subconscious of like, we know what the hook is. We know what the gimmick is. And then obviously they kind of throw it a little bit on its ear on that last page. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I really like this. And this is definitely going to be one read day and date. I'm not going to sit on and wait and read the whole thing at once. Uh, This was a strong enough first issue that that laid the groundwork going forward that it's going to be a little bit more fast paced than the first series. Right, because the first one was more of a like intrigue, you know what I mean. Now it's, it's what's going on with these multiple houses. So, right, you're you were an, you were unraveling a mystery in the first series. This one, you know what the mystery is. We're just maybe weaving another ball into that existing mystery that you're already aware of. Let's put right. it that way. Juggle an extra ball, kind of a deal. There you go. Thank you. Um, so that's what we read from this past week. Let's get into what we're looking forward to coming out this week. If you head over to longboxheroes.com every Tuesday around noon Eastern time, we put up the poll post, which is a link to a link to all the books that are coming out this week. Whether you get your books in print, whether you get them digitally, whether you get them sent to your home, however it is that you get your books, be forewarned, be forearmed, know what's coming out this week. Todd and I attempt to guess what the other is most looking forward to coming out this week. Todd is currently in the lead over me with one correct guess. Uh, And I am going to him and ha here, and I'm going to play games and we're going to try to stretch this segment out a little bit and say well we don't we don't include previously printed stuff right right and that's uh, the other things like an anthology book that we're probably only getting for one story Uh and i think the book that todd is most looking forward to coming out this week would be saga number 67 it is Saga 67, even though I'm really jacked for Fantastic Four 22 because mm-hmm. of all the Fantastic Four news. Um, but I'm guessing the same. I'm not going to him and ha, I'll speed it up a little bit. Is the book you're also looking forward to Saga 67, Joe? Of course. I, I didn't even I don't I don't need to look. It's been a long time since it's been an issue of Saga. One month is too long. Right. It's back. I'm so happy. I cannot wait to read Saga again. I'm glad. I'm looking forward to two more issues, so. Yeah. Uh, Ed Brubaker did a bit in his newsletter. Ed Brubaker. Brian K. Vaughn did a bit in his newsletter this past week uh, where he said that he was going to have spoilers for the uh, issue in the newsletter. Right. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom. And in this, instead, it was a, it was a scan of a page of original art of like some 1940s Superman comic that he just recently purchased. Right. And he was kind of like, oh, I put this in here instead because I don't want you to, I don't want to spoil Saga. But like the whole thing is like, Saga spoilers, Saga spoilers, get to the end of the newsletter, Saga spoilers. And then it's mm-hmm. like, here's the Superman page I bought from the 40s. Right, and you're afraid to look at it, you know what I mean, as you're scrolling down? I wanted to see what the bit was. I knew, I had a feeling it was going to be a bit, and I was okay what? with that. Yeah. I think Brian K. Vaughn likes to spoil his books. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it was just a lot of, you know, like, obviously this was the big push, and, you know, the trade is out, and of the last thing, and, you know, obviously the delays and that sort of stuff kind of hinder mm-hmm. it, and he, he did say, you know, of course, make sure that you Read the previous six issues before you go into this. If you already haven't, if this is your first saga, of course, you know, no one's expecting you to familiarize yourself with the previous 66 issues, but at least read the last six before you dive into this one. Right. Are you going to reread the six just because? <laughs> uh, I don't have that sort of time in my life. I, wish I was I just stop. curious if you would do that because I heard a couple of people at the shop talking about it, like that they, with Saga coming back, that they might reread because that was the only storyline between you know now and the big gap you know what i mean so yeah and i i did like this get a chance to talk to becky at the shop last week uh you know she does the sandwich board the chalkboard outside the uh, the store she always does some sort of fun art quip release hot book whatever uh this month it was that saga's coming back right Mm mm-hmm and she had said that no less than like three or four people stopped into the shop this week, this past week, saying like, oh, my God, I saw that the sign is Saga out yet. 
Right. So again, it's crazy to think that there's people that live that like they possibly live that saga is the only comic book that they read. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Becky sign, they wouldn't know that the new issue was coming out. Right. They'd be surprised seven months from now. Right. When the trade comes out, you know, Mm -hmm. Oh man, I tell you when there is a piece of media that I consume, whatever it is. And I think that you're similar, but you kind of obsess over it. You know, I need to know when it's coming out, where it is. I don't want it spoiled, but we always say, like, ah, just tell me the date and I'll be there. Yeah. You know, I, I, I am the same. I will say because I'm the old, you know, the old elder statesman of the soon to be named network. Um, I'm becoming less of that way. But I'm also so much of like a recluse that a lot of information doesn't break down my walls. So that's that's why I'm not like, oh, my God, I got to know. I got to know. It's just like, oh. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll look it up occasionally. So I, I think there is too much media to consume, and things do slip through the cracks. You know, we we make the joke we're like six years on now uh, on about it that mm. we completely missed Outcast season two, right? You know, and we joke about that, but then like Wait. we revealed that it was like only broadcast in Canada and like the UK, mm. and then it didn't come to the United States. For another right. year, but it was available legally. I assure you, on different sites that you could find it from, you yeah. know, all sorts of stuff like that. But you know, sometimes stuff slips through the cracks. You know, you you try to you know make sure that you have those filters out there. It's like, oh, if there's a new Spider-Man thing, or if there's a new, you know, whatever thing, right? That it, it that it filters through to me that it doesn't miss. And I'll get. I'll say this: I had to at this shop recently ask when Houses of the Unholy was coming out because I wanted to be ready for it. The Brubaker Phillips thing, right? Yeah, I knew I guess something I could look up, but I was sitting at the shop, so it's like, oh, you got the you have the computer right there. Just let me know. And I'm like, because it just I don't have all the spreadsheets and the numbers and the dates. So it's like, oh I kind of have to uh, is it is it still coming out? Did it move kind of a deal, you know? So No, those get solicited pretty far out in advance. Mm-hmm. And Brubaker and Phillips have their their bit down, you know. Right, but due to printing st- I, and I only ask because like I don't keep the the date ingrained in my brain or written mm-hmm. down. But also, it, all it takes is for a printer to get backed up, and it's not their fault. Do you know what I mean? Like any, it could move for m- various other reasons than creators being late. So right, and, and I will, you know, and obviously I will say, um, it's two weeks away as we record this. Yep. You know? Wonderful that it's coming cover. out. Wonderful cover that. We'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into, uh, while well, you're over at longboxheroes.com, of course, be sure to check out um, past episodes of this show, past episodes of Longbox Heroes After Dark, and, of course, be sure to check out uh, Todd and Joe Have Issues as we are doing a full, complete reread of Gail Simone's Secret Six. We are currently in the main Secret Six book. Um, it's crazy to think that, you know, we're, what, what do we only got, like, five months left of this at this point? Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, crazy to think, you know. Um, but this is the wrap-up to the second story arc. And I feel bad as we sit here and think. I, I don't know what the name of the story arc is just because of the way that everything kind of gets collected and the way that I have everything in the have issues posts um, with all this sort of stuff. But um, this comes to a violent and bloody end. The name of the story arc is Depths. Yep. Okay. Um, so, you know, as we talked last time, the Grendel has been released. Uh, the Grendel is what the, the main baddie, Mr. Smythe, had in his back pocket just in case things went sideways with the big prison that he had, with all the Amazons there. And, of course, wouldn't you know, things do go sideways. And the Grendel, who is in the thrall of Mr. Smythe, Mr. Smythe makes the uh, huge mistake as the Grendel is about to devour, if you will, poetically, Wonder Woman. He says, uh, hang on, before you do that, could you take care of this other problem that we're having here regarding (laughs) the people that I hired? And if he just waited like two minutes, I think both problems could have been effectively taken care of. You know, pretty much, yep. Uh, right. So obviously, our six 
after, you know, their typical usual disagreements and, you know, misunderstandings and so forth, they're back on the same page. Mr. Smythe is the baddie. We need to take him down. The Amazons are on our side. And, you know, we we have that ongoing bit regarding the relationship between Bane and Scandal Savage. Uh, Scandal ends up taking the Venom when Bane won't. Um, and Bane, make, Bane makes a good uh, case why he's not taking the Venom besides the fact that it's a drug and he doesn't want to take it. And he did take it in the previous story arc. Of course, but he's like, no, you need my mind as a tactician, and the Venom will not help that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like I said, so Scandal takes it, she has to freak out, she goes after Grendel, um, while everything else is going on with the battle between Smythe's forces, the Six, and the Amazons, uh, <laughs> Ragdoll sneaks in through a duct, and bashes Smythe's head in with a, a log wrench, Yep, I, and, and just because it, it'll annoy me, it's a pipe wrench. But, but. Okay, mm-hmm. pipe wrench, thank you. Mm-hmm. Another win for the Todd. <laughs> yeah, that one L on my, my resume today, but anyway. Yep. That was a bi- it was a big L, though. It was a capital L, right? <laughs> yep, these are small Ws, but go ahead. Uh, we see a, a little bit of, you know, obviously a bit of a chink in the armor of Jeanette in regards to maybe what could be an exploit or a weakness uh, in regards to her, um, as Smythe and his main crony, uh, Emil, terrible name, uh, are dispatched, uh, Artemis puts the guy in charge, he puts the guy that was like the, the head jailer, uh, from a couple issues ago that chased the other guys off saying like, oh, stop being sleaze bags to Artemis. Mm-hmm. I'm the one who truly cares for and Artemis is like, no, you're just as bad as they are, if not worse. It's just that you hold yourself to a higher standard. The Amazons leave. There's other prisoners there. Uh, Artemis puts that guy in charge of everything as they make their escape. And uh, we get a big moment at the end of the book. But before we get to that big moment at the end of the book, was there anything else you wanted to talk about from the story arc? Right. The only thing that, like, uh, the the pipe wrench bit where uh, Ragdoll beats up Smythe with it, um, when he's – when they have it uh, and it's like it seems like it's buried in the back of his head, that kind of gives me big creeps from the art, and I, and I love it. That night, we kind of said it last week that this is uh, what was it? Amazon's attack around this time. Yeah. That this is kind of like like our tie-in or aftermath of it. And the thing I like about uh, Gail doing these is like we had the battle for the cow, and now we have like an Amazon's attack kind of like tie-in, and they're absolutely seamless. That I didn't need to know about a big am like it's explained briefly but like succinctly in this that something happened with the Amazons and this is kind of where they went and I'm like God I love when a writer can just make it painless to read a book like this about a uh, like a tied in crossover and uh, that's about it. Yep. So we get the bit they're on their way home from the mission and. Uh... <laughs> Bane not only takes over control of the Secret Six, mm-hmm. um, but he also kicks uh, Scandal Savage off the team. Well, she's made some mistakes, Joe. Yeah. Uh, he says, every mission that you take us on ends in injuries and non-payment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am assuming command. You observe my orders. Jeanette agrees. Um, she's with me. And in that little panel there, I love the way that Jeanette is drawn. Mm-hmm. Just kind of like you could tell from her eyes and her body language um, that like she's doing this for Scandal's own good. Yeah. You know? Or even the team's own good, too, you know? Yes. But I do like the shock of of the betrayal on uh, Scandal's face when he tells her, too. So Yep. Um, and obviously this is one of those things where this is a book that you and I probably have not read since it first came out, you know, multiple times, at least for me, I know I probably read this two or at least three times since it came out. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's been a long time since I've read it. So all this stuff exists in my head, but I love revisiting it and having it reshake it out. 
I will say, even though I love Secret Six as, as, as a book, I only ever read the Gail Simone, like, uh, this era once. It was so good, I read it once. And this is a, like, there are things, there are high notes that I'm going to remember. But it's like, oh, I forgot Bane, you know, took, just wrestled control and stuff like that. So I like that it's 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 new to me in spots, so I'm having a different kind of fun. Right, so next month, uh, we have a issue that is essentially a dead shot one shot right kind of sort of maybe an origin maybe a little bit peek into his psyche sort of thing mm-hmm. fill in writer by the way oh fill in uh fill in writer or fill in artist fill in writer this is a john ostrander issue oh yes 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 so yes thank you so again mm-hmm. i because i knew it was an uh califiori was doing the art on this one i forgot that it was john ostrander writing the issue as well my apologies but because it's a dead shot it's okay it's part of the main secret six line it's not a gale written issue but it's key to everything that's going to be going on right right and no you know shade on gale for me like if there's anybody you're going to have write your dead shot issue He's okay. He the, he's the to me might be the definitive Deadshot writer because he like laid so much groundwork for him. You know what I mean? And I think, and I say I think, sadly, this is our last uh, Nicola Scott issue. I do think so, but happily, I think it's the beginning of Califuri's run. Yes, so. it is the beginning of Jim Califuri's run, and we do get a couple of the issues, specifically the ones that cross over with Blackest Night when we get there. That are uh, written by both Gail and uh, John Ostrander. Right. So, you know, John Ostrander is still involved with this as it's all going on. So, again, next mm-hmm. week, not a Gail issue, but a main issue in everything that's going on, right? True. Uh, while you're over at longboxheroes.com, uh, check out our store. Get some shirts and pins and stickers with our fancy logo on them. Uh, make any and all of your purchases through. On eBay through our eBay affiliate link. Uh, this page contains affiliate links for eBay. We may receive a small commission on purchases that you make. You can use the affiliate link anytime you want to buy anything on eBay and help us at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the best and easiest way to help us out that gives you the most bang for your buck would be to sign up for our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Longbox Heroes, as little as a dollar a month, you are going to get two bonus shows from Todd and myself. One is Previewing the Past, where we look at 30 years ago this month's previews catalog. Just because of the way that the weeks work out and stuff going on and whatever it is, we're going to be recording uh, August 1994, not this Friday, but next Friday. Um, $5 folks get everything first. Everybody else gets it two weeks later. Uh, shortly, everyone will have their ear holes on <laughs> Comic Book Oddity's most recent episode, and that is uh, Legend of the Superheroes, The Challenge, and The Roast. You nailed it, Joe. Yes, and I didn't even have it written down. I purposely have my glasses off while I'm saying all this. Mm-hmm. Um, we look at some of the lesser known, uh, maybe more malign, maybe forgotten on purpose maybe ties into Deadpool three <laughs> stuff from the Marvel from comic books of them trying to make movies, TV shows, whatever out of those properties and failing. Uh, we discuss them uh, over on the Patreon. Uh, any level of the Patreon is going to get you access to our discord. Uh, that's the pinned link at the top of the uh, page on the Patreon. Any level of course is also going to get you the full scans of those previews catalogs, expertly done, high quality scans, professionally done. Um, soon we're going to have to add the Marvel ones in when Marvel splits off mid 1995. Mm-hmm. And uh, the $5 level, as I mentioned, you're going to get the main, sh- the, the bonus shows, you're going to get them two weeks before everyone else. And you're also going to get long box heroes after dark two days before everyone else. So you can listen to these shows in the correct listening order. Mm hmm. And boy, oh boy, if you drop the hundred dollar tier, did we have a did we have a doozy of a show this week off my let's say uh the hundred dollar tier cutting room floor was an unofficial the Rob watch. There you go. Yes. Unofficial. Unofficial. Um speaking of the Rob, let's get into his greatest creation. Um 
teaming up with uh, Roy Thomas's greatest creation, right? Very true. As a matter of fact, maybe his name should have came first, Joe. What, above the credits? Yes. Above the title, above our double, above yes. everyone and everything. Right. Um, so uh, this is Deadpool and Wolverine, um, the biggest R-rated movie of all time. Um, the most beloved comic book movie of all time, the greatest Ryan Reynolds movie of all time. Um, everyone loves this movie cause it's the best. Mm-hmm. Good night, everybody. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Remember, no, what? I'm sorry. Ah, come on now. <laughs> right. No. So, um, spoiler talk, spoiler talk, spoiler talk, of course, uh, in regards to all of this. And... Uh, the gist of the movie, if you've seen the trailer, you know the bare bones of it. There's a little bit of stuff that they do keep out of the trailer regarding the plot, as bare bones as it is, right? Mm-hmm. But the main thing that this movie is selling itself on, I think, is the cameos and the special appearances. And, you know, Deadpool is now infiltrating into the mainline Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right. And he's bringing Wolverine with him, whether Wolverine wants to come or not. Sure. Um, so essentially what it is, is uh, Guy Paradox from the TVA comes and gets Deadpool and says, listen, the anchor character of your timeline is dead. Um, so your timeline is dying, but we have need for you. We have purpose for you. So we're going to send you off to the main timeline. Right. The 616. The 616. The sacred timeline, if you will. Mm hmm. Uh, Deadpool says, no, even though my dream is to be on the Avengers, um, to do things in Avengers lobbies with the Hulk hands, to mm-hmm. have Thor hold me and look at me long- longingly and lovingly. No, I really care about the people that were on my that were at my apartment for my birthday party. So I'm going to steal one of your devices. I'm going to go f- bring Wolverine back because nobody dies. OK, this Wolverine's dead for real. Let me go find a different Wolverine from one of the other timelines and bring them here. Right. Well, none of that matters because Paradox is making a machine that is going to speed up the dissolution of Deadpool's timeline. So now the clock is ticking. And then they get dumped off into the wasteland where all the junk and forgotten characters go to. Mm-hmm. And then I guess that's where we meet the real villain of the movie, which is Cassandra Nova, which I I marked out for, I popped for. Because I remember she was mentioned or teased or something in some of the early stills from shooting the movie. Right. But all of the marketing and everything else since has not mentioned her at all. So when she shows back up, I was like, oh, Cassandra Nova! Oh my goodness! Like, one yep. of the most Grant Morrison but characters in history Mm -hmm. is like the main protagonist in this film. So now you have the race of like, okay, we need to get, we need to stop Cassandra Nova because she's found out about this machine. And if she gets this machine, then she's going to be able to use this machine to not only get rid of the Deadpool Wolverine timeline, but all of the timelines. Right. And then she'll rule the wasteland, uh, you know, and be, king high on the mountain kind of a deal yeah so what'd you think of this movie todd i really love this i okay like let's define love do you know what i mean like the and i think you may have said it in the discord and i've heard a lot of people say it and i've heard more and more people describe it exactly the same way this movie is big dumb fun and that's i don't think there's a better way to put it um I, I I legitimately had a blast on this because I managed to stay away from all the spoilers. I knew uh, Cassandra Nova was was involved, but I didn't know anything else. Um, Deadpool for me, my mileage may vary, but I'm you know I'm a Wolverine guy when it comes to it. And I thought Hugh Jackman doing a different thing. The fact that they even do the joke in the movie where it's like, oh, how do we? respect the sacrifice that we got in, in Logan, one of the greatest movies, which is one of my favorite all-time comic book movies. And they're like, we don't. We dig up his corpse and we resurrect him. And then they're like, we have to go a different route. And I'm like, 
Good. I'll at least take that. Doesn't sully the memory of that book. And then we get a legit, a legit like heartfelt L- Logan story through this because he's the worst Logan. And like we get a story about like how the X Men were killed. It's kind of like an old man Logan story, but it's not. So I was like, this movie shouldn't be all the uh, low key, and I don't mean low key from the Marvel Universe, but all the, the dorky, dumb Deadpool jokes and then like depth with Wolverine. So I, 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 I loved it for what it was, if that makes any sense. Um, so, I, again, I can't say that I love this movie. I like this movie. Mm-hmm. It's good. I recommend it to people. I would never say anyone um, not see it. Okay? Right. But y- some of the things that you mentioned, of course, like Logan. Logan is one of the best movies, period. Like, yep. the fact that it's a comic book movie, like, I would put it, like, up there. Because, you know, obviously, ma- it's not a mainline Marvel Cinematic mo- Universe movie. But I would put it up there for mashing everything together. Like, it's Winter Soldier caliber? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, it was that instantly when they did the first trailer with Johnny Cash's Hurt as the theme music. Yeah. Like, you're done. You got me. Let's go. Um, and one of the things, and, you know, they, because he's a movie character and whatever, uh, they've tried to make Deadpool a redeemable character right Mm -hmm. and i think deadpool works better as like the monkey cheese character who's just like unbridled chaos you know every once in a while where you think maybe he has a heart of gold there's an alternative motive to it but the movies have kind of filtered into the comics where they try to make deadpool like he's not that bad of a guy sort of thing Right. Well, Ryan Reynolds, and this isn't a jab at you, but as we were discussing Doctor Doom, Ryan Reynolds is the definitive version of Deadpool now to the masses. Yeah, and and I'm okay with that. I've I've come to grips with. Um, I, I said this to someone privately, and I'll say this publicly here. Mm-hmm. Um, Ryan Reynolds has done more for comic book movies overall by his portrayal of Deadpool than what The Rock has done for his portrayal of comic book stuff. Right. And I kind of sort of like The Rock. So I guess I kind of sort of like Ryan Reynolds a little bit more than The Rock. Okay. Okay. Just because, like, there's a genuineness and he's really worked hard to kind of, like... And it's one of those things where, from the start, even when it was the bad Wolverine Origins Deadpool, to now, Ryan Reynolds has... Beat feet, press, publicity, everything. Deadpool. Right. And he's pretty much cop to being part of the leak of the test footage. Right. So, like, he, he, yes, he has put, you know, comic book, like, you know, it's not just him because obviously there were the other Marvel movies. But, yeah, like, just... He he's given it a push, especially in the lean time now, if that makes any sense. Yes. So So I, I can't hate on Ryan Reynolds and listen, I'm always gonna have issues with like he plays the same character in every movie. I mm-hmm. go back to the original Deadpool movie where his horribly scarred up disfigured face is just like a few pock marks. Right. Because we can't have Ryan Reynolds look too unattractive. Mm-hmm. But bypassing all of that, um, I get they try to make Deadpool a redeemable character, and I think having Wolverine as an actual likable, redeemable character in this movie helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think a majority of the people that are going to see this movie are not going to see sad Wolverine find a purpose in his life. Right. They're going to see jokes and action sequences and cameos. That's fine, but they and get that's fine. right, right. They they you know they don't have to watch Wolverine be sad and you know deep. They get to watch Wolverine sad and deep. But 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 I'm with you. I I I get what you're saying. But I equate it to like what they did with Harley Quinn. 
it's what they're doing with Deadpool. It's, you know, and that's Jim, J- uh, Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor back then. It's like, we're taking her away from her evil roots. And like, you know, it's not the same because Deadpool did do some good where it's like, oh, we could make more money with Dead- Deadpool as more of a goodie than a baddie. Like they're both tweeners, man, but they go, they, they lean towards the goodie side, if that makes any sense. And there's more money in that. And I can't begrudge, you know, making more money if that makes any sense. Right. And, and I, I, I disc, I don't want to discredit the movie too much and say that so much of it hangs on the cameos. Cause a lot of it does hang on the cameos, but there's like four big action sequences in this, uh, like five big action sequences in this movie. Mm-hmm. And they're all really good. Yeah, and I went to go see the movie with April, my son and two of his friends. Right. Mm-hmm. They, the kids, 12 year olds loved the opening fight scene. Right. April and I loved the fight scene in the Honda Odyssey. And that the Honda Odyssey goes hard, man. Yeah. And I, I think that was inspired. I think that was fun. And you get other action sequences that are like these big moments. And mm-hmm. listen, they're CGI enhanced. So like, you know, when it's a big open field or it's the snow or it's the desert or whatever it is, you could kind of see some of the CGI trickery. Right. Whereas when it's them in the Honda Odyssey battling each other, there is some CGI trickery, but because it's close quarters, it's a little bit more difficult to see. Right. It's more, and it's probably more practical because they ain't the big body twist and hits like off in the field. You know what I mean? Like we're doing the big stunts where Deadpool is going to be all uh, uh, crumpled up like an accordion, if that makes yeah. any sense. So in the car, it's like, oh, there's, let's just say there's a lot of stabbing in the car is what's going on. Yeah. Um, and obviously we have the cameos and we have the tons of comic nods, right? Mm-hmm. So we get the bit where it's the montage to power of love from back to the future. Right. Where Deadpool is going through the different timelines to find a Wolverine. That was awesome as a comic book fan. Man. Okay. Awesome as a comic book fan. You get the comic accurately short five foot three Wolverine. You get the <sighs> okay. named John Byrne Wolverine. And then you get the Hulk bit with the reflection in the claws. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you get, get the, the crucified uh, Wolverine. Right. From Uncanny 251. You get Age of Apocalypse, which I marked out huge oh, for. Like we, we we've oh. run that Age of Apocalypse has made it into the comic. Like like comic accurate Age of <laughs> like the the X Men Apocalypse movie was supposed to be their take on Age of Apocalypse. And I say fooey. I say this this moment of him looking exactly as he was drawn in the comics is was like amazing, right? He only had the one hand, also, right? Yes. So now I will say this: when that popped up, I was like. Joe's in nerd heaven right now. Yeah. When he sees this, like, cause it's not for me, but I get it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yep. so I even like, even I nerd out when, when they get accurate, if that makes any sense. So right. it's like really, really cool. And but uh, I do want to say that it was cool to see comic book accurate short Wolverine that I always say got me thrown out of a restaurant in San Diego. Oh, really? Yes. Um, we, when I went to San Diego for the con, and that was around right after, not right after, but I know the movie had come out was X2. And we went, and there's somebody I know uh, who who loves wrestling as much as you and likes to argue with me a lot. All right. Um, and we went to a restaurant, and he went off on a thing where it was like, nothing about Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is comic book accurate. And I'm like, well, he's six foot four. And I said, well, I can't argue that. One. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's not the one, the hill I'm going to die. On. But he has no berserker rage. I said, what about when he killed all those people when they were coming into the mansion to get the kids? Remember? He like gets the, a berserker rage moment in X2. Right. That's the one I'm, that's in X2. Yes. So I'm going off about that. And we're getting louder and louder. Me and him. We're going at it. Tooth and nail. Right. And eventually the waiter or whoever comes over and hands us our check, hands us our check and goes, we're closing now. <sighs> and I, I like on the door, it was like 830. Well, not at the door. It was like the time, maybe it was 830. 
and the restaurant closed at 11 right on the door. <laughs> and we're like, you close 11. No, we're closing now. We'd like you to cash in your, your check, please. And I was like, all right, we finished. We, 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 you know, we were pretty much done eating. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we ended up paying the bill given, you know, and we left because we were a couple of bumpkins from Pennsylvania you know, arguing over Wolverine in a crowded restaurant. If you, if you, I'll just say this. If you went to the Sizzler, you wouldn't have had that problem. No, we would never have that problem. So when I saw that, for you, like, like that's a joke for one person. That was for me, and I was crying at it. <laughs> so uh, they end up uh, Wolverine. Oh, oh go we ahead. Get one more Wolverine. We get uh, Superman Wolverine. Okay. I did not like Superman Wolverine. But he was the fan casting for the longest time. Okay. If you're going to go that route, I would have liked them. And I had somebody attempt to explain that to me. And I'm like, maybe that's a little too inside. And I know you get the bit of Deadpool saying, like, oh, my goodness, the rumors are true. You... Right. And, then, and he said, we would treat you better than those jerks down the street. Yeah. I'm fine. I loved it. I thought it was funny. It was fine. I think they should have. Uh, I don't even know if he's in acting anymore, even if he's still alive. They should have gotten Doug Ray Scott to do it. I thought you were going to say Army Hammer. No. Do you remember that Doug Ray Scott was supposed to be the original Wolverine before Hugh Jackman? I don't know who Doug Ray Scott is. Nobody knows who Doug Ray Scott is. (laughs) Because he was was cast to be Wolverine in the first X-Men movie, and then he decided to take a James Bond movie instead. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well we're going to do the movie without you. We're just going to cast someone else. And he's like, oh, that's fine. It's just some stupid comic book movie. James Bond is a proven franchise and I'll be a big star. (sighs) To this day, he's still making films. I'm looking, I'm looking up Dugray. I I might be mispronouncing his name. It might be Dugray. Right. Dugay. No, I might. And again, I'm going to take that back. It wasn't a, James Bond movie, it was um, Mission Impossible 2 that he ended up doing. Right, the best Mission Impossible. Right, he did that over... uh, He was in uh, Ever After, which you would know. Mm -hmm. Um, He was in an episode of Doctor Who. Uh, He was in the Batman TV, or the Batwoman TV show. Okay. Um... He's done things, but, like, he's not Wolverine, right? No. But, yeah, he was originally cast to be Wolverine, and he turned it down to do Mission Impossible 2. I will say I did see a good – I'm not a big meme guy, but I did see a meme, and they had, like, since, you know, X, like, X year was certain year. Like, we've had three Spider-Men. Mm-hmm. We've had – X amount of Batmans, because you have Ad Fleck, you have Bale, blah, blah, blah. We've had this many Supermans, which was like a ridiculous amount, because you have to throw in, like, Ralph a couple of times, and they're like, and we've had one Wolverine in that whole time. And then everybody's like, two, now Cavill is is one. I was like, Yeah, that don't count. Shut up. Uh, So then, uh, so Deadpool and Wolverine attempt to go to the TVA. They get dumped off into... Uh, the Wasteland, and they had a bit where they're showing, like, the bits of the Avengers, and it is canonically now in comics that Deadpool grew up, wa- even though he was Canadian, he grew up wanting to be Captain America. Mm-hmm. So, like, he marks out when he sees Captain America on the screen when they're showing Avengers footage. They end up in the Wasteland, and they come, aco- uh, they come upon Chris Evans, and I knew what the joke was. This one wasn't spoiled on me, thankfully. Right, but we knew it. Like, I, I'm not trying to like toot my own. Like, I was talking with Matt about this and a couple. Of, we've been talking about he's showing up as who he showed up as for the longest time. Well, you know we're I mean? gonna, yeah. So Chris Evans shows up. Deadpool immediately thinks it's gonna be Captain America. He's no, no, no. It. It's Human Torch. Yep. He thinks he's going to say, I could do this all day. And he ends up saying flame on. Right. And it was good. Cause he had like the poncho on and he had the blue out- out- outfit underneath. Yeah. So like, as I saw it coming, I'm like, I know where this is going, but for the, like the, like the, the, the regular people, I'm like, they're going to find it amusing, so. but it was a fun bit. I liked it a lot. Right? right. So you have a bunch of fights. We go to the wasteland. We see a bunch of people from the Brian Singer X-Men movies 
Some played by the same people, some not played by the same people. But like, I'll, I'll say one improvement: the the guy in the striped shirt from Punisher was a much better version. Nah. That's all I'm gonna say. Nah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe a ten, I, another ten grand he would have stood for that long, you know. I was laughing because I was seeing it with Art Josh, not younger Josh. Yeah. And he was like, he's like, isn't that isn't that supposed to be uh, Kevin Nash? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm happier now. So. <laughs> That's not in a billion dollar movie. Yeah, he would have been. He's he's insufferable now. He would have been more insufferable. Right. Um. So then we find out that there's a resistance that Johnny Storm was a part of. Mm -hmm. And the resistance, some of it was spoiled on me. None of it was spoiled. So some of it was spoiled on me because, and another bit was spoiled on me as well, which we're going to come back to because we're kind of all over the place with this, right? Um, In my stupid Marvel Puzzle Quest game, there's like daily quests and missions and so forth. Right. And the new season that started on Thursday is Deadpool Wolverine themed. And Mm -hmm. usually they roll out the stuff about the season like two, three days ahead of time. But they're like, because of the movie, like nothing's coming out until like the day of. We're keeping everything tight lipped, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a set of missions where it was like play missions with your team consisting of Deadpool, Wolverine, Elektra, or X-23. And I'm like, son of a... Ugh, you know? Yeah. The only... Uh, okay, I will take that back. X-23 was spoiled on me. Okay. But that was the one that I... At least going in, that was the one I expected, if that makes any sense. Okay. So I was like, they're probably going to have her. Because she was she was getting a lot of play, like, doing interviews and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, she's... But she has to do the fake, oh, I'm not in the movie, blah, 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 you know? I'm only at the premiere posing with the cast. Mm-hmm. Um, so that got spoiled on me because of my stupid game. Um, then we get Wesley Snipes' Blade, big pop in the theater, right? Yep, with, with his gray soul patch. Right. And then we get Channing Tatum as Gambit. I, I and I if you knock this down because like who knows that he was gonna play Remy LeBeau back in the day, I'm like, I don't care. This if this is just for me, I'm one hundred percent fine with it. I was fine with it too, because I got the bit. Mm-hmm. But maybe sometimes the comic book accurate costume don't work on the big screen. But by it not working. It works, I guess. I'm. That's the. That's one hundred percent. The bit is what it is. Is they go. You want comic book accurate, and then they shove out great accent from Channing Tatum in the costume and go. Really, that's what you want. Really, and it works. I, it's it's a it's a teaching moment, Joe. Is what it is. And I don't, I don't have the same affinity for the Jennifer Garner Electra movie that maybe one other person does. Mm-hmm. But good for her catching a paycheck, right? You know. I agree. Good for yeah. her coming back. I okay. I not to jump ahead, but there was one. There was definitely one spot where I thought uh, that we were going to get an end credit scene with Ben Affleck was going to show up to stand with her. Like, cause that was all they could afford or get him for. Do you know what I mean? It would be like, Oh, he died, but whatever. And then in the end there was going to be like, I didn't die. That, uh, hey, Dare, daredevil's okay off camera. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. we didn't get that. So I don't know if Ben Affleck has the same humor about himself and his life in 2024 as he did back in say 2000. Right. No, I don't. I think when, if, if anything, they were going to say like, this is when they contacted Ben Affleck to be back for Deadpool Wolverine. And it's him outside the door with that, with that lost look with the cigarette hanging. Carrying the Duncan in the yeah, rain. Pretty, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so they all come together. They, 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 they do their assault on Cassandra Nova's thing. They have to get the helmet off the juggernaut. To get it on her, to stop her from using her mind powers. But once they get it on her, then obviously she can't use her mind powers to send them back. But Doctor Strange had come through, and she had gotten a little bip or bob from him. So she opens up a portal so they can go back. 
And then as they're making their final assault to stop Paradox, this is when he summons the Deadpool core, right? Right. Now, we were tipped off about the Deadpool core earlier in the movie when we were introduced to Nice Pool as played Good by... Pool. Good was that? Pool. Good Pool. Now, was it Good Pool or Nice Pool? I'm 99% sure it was Good Pool. Okay. The, the only reason I ask is because... He is a new character in the Marvel Puzzle Quest game. Mm-hmm. And in the Marvel Puzzle Quest game, his name is Hot Pool. Well, that's because that's Ryan Reynolds, the old double R's real face. And he's the handsomest man in all of cinema, Joe. Right. But Mike, that lends that leads my question to be. Now, I will say you say good. According to IMDb, it says it's nice. OK, you could listen. I'll take a, another small L here. You'll take a small... Right, so nice in the movie, hot in the game. It makes me wonder if it was originally hot, because these games like have to get like developed like months in advance, mm-hmm. and it was hot in the movie, and then later they decided, like, eh, change it to nice, and then didn't change it to nice in the games and stuff, right? Right. Um, so again, that was one thing. And one other thing I want to mention, and I was doing some research on this, and I don't know if this was me Mandela affecting myself Mm -hmm. in the early teaser trailer. Wasn't cable in with the group of friends along with Colossus or no, no, I don't think he was. Okay. Unless they were using footage from the other movies. Do you know what I mean? Like doing a flashback stuff. Right. That's the only thing I, cause I could have swore I remembered seeing cable in there and they do a bit in the movie saying that like the characters from uh the second movie didn't test well and i'm like oh i wonder if that was like a a mid movie change like with the nitpicky thing and again it doesn't change the enjoyment of the movie whether it's nice or good or hot pool but whatever right mm-hmm. um so then the deadpool core shows up that's another silly action sequence you know it's the one shot like roving Like, you see in, like, so many other movies from, like, Old Boy to Raid Redemption and that sort of thing. But because it's, like, hundreds of Deadpools against Deadpool and Wolverine just getting ripped apart, it's played for laughs. It's very well done. It's very silly, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a gunslinger Deadpool guy myself, but go ahead. Right. Um, Headpool, I think they could have done a better job on the CGI. It looked like... A, it looked like a Roger, Roger Rabbit character interacting with the rest of everything else in the movie. It looked good to me. And did you see the popcorn bucket they had of that? Um, no. I, I always saw the pe- popcorn buckets with like the open mouths and stuff. Right, but they have a popcorn bucket that is that with the beanie on top with the propeller. Oh, okay. I think it's a – whatever. They had one. I didn't – at the counter at the theater I was at, but I didn't get any concession. So I saw it and I was like, oh, that's going to be in this movie if that makes any sense. So yeah. That was – I'm sorry. That was spoiled on me then. So they fight through all the things, but they forget that they all have a healing factor, except for nice, good, hot pool. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the healing factor, and there's like a gratuitous violence bit with him. Deadpool using him as a human shield. And then when it's revealed that... And this, I didn't feel, was at least earned for part three. I think, obviously, it would have been more earned if you had seen all three of them. But then Deadpool's friend Peter shows up. Mm-hmm. And all the other Deadpools just stop fighting because Peter's here. And every Deadpool has a Peter in their universe. And without Deadpool, without Peter, then Deadpool isn't who he is. So all the Deadpools stop their murderous rampage and just like start chanting Peter for Deadpool Prime's Peter that shows up. Right. I'll say this um, because I saw three movies. It, It is what it is. Even though he was in the movie earlier, so it's not like he was just brand, brand new. You know what I mean? Right. So he was, like, they established him. That's the guy that Deadpool right. works with the car dealership. He's one of his friends at the birthday party. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that was a role that was a role that they may, I think that was a thing they may have added later that would have been a certain other actor's role that didn't do the third movie, if that makes any mm, sense. Yes. That it was kind of a big uh, middle finger to that person. It was like, this could have been you if you weren't, you know, if you weren't so I don't want to do this movie. And deplorable and canceled and not oh, funny. Some of that stuff, too. But right. you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that should have been a different character. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Because that character was in one, two, and not three, where this character was in not one, in two, and in three. Yeah. So then Cassandra Nova shows up. She's using the machine. She's going to, once she destroys the timeline that they're in, Mm -hmm. then she'll be able to start destroying the other timelines. MacGuffin, they have to get the positive and negative things of the power source together. Deadpool and Wolverine are fighting over who's going to be the one to go do it. And then it turns out they both have to do it together as real friends. Mm-hmm. We finally get the big reveal of uh, Hugh Jackman popping off his top to show what chicken and rice could do for you. Mm-hmm. Um, they end up saving the day. They end up saving Deadpool's timeline. The cast off characters did all get their hero moments and fighting Cassandra Nova and her goons. Mm-hmm. Wolverine goes off to have his own adventures. And didn't at least some of the cast off people come and like stay with Deadpool, like in his little world or whatever. Yeah. Because now this new Wolverine is their anchor character. Mm -hmm. So he came over because he has his redeeming arc about, you know, uh, his whole X-Men people dying. But yeah, that's kind of like, cause they're still, they don't come to the Marvel 616. They stay in, uh, right. uh, whatever, the whatever number it was. And they're going to lead their little happy, happy life. I just want to say when uh, Cassandra Novus kept doing the fingers in people's faces and heads, that creeped me out. That, so was, she, that was really well done. The CGI on that was very nicely seamless. I liked it. Carrying people like w- around. I was like, okay, that was icky. And the bit like when they get to the end and Ryan Reynolds had kind of done the joke throughout the movie until you are dead, Hugh Jackman. You will be doing Wolverine. And with this now, like, if, like, you can kind of say, like, when Logan was Logan, that movie was like, oh, I'm never going to do it again. But since he's not betraying that character, he's like, yeah, until, like, we're going to see a legit old man Logan movie when Hugh Jackman is, like, 68 years old. And that's okay. He's really good at it. it. I'm fine with it. But like, like I say, like when we come back to it, like where I love this movie, like say love is I loved it because I had a fun time when I put this on top of any truly great movie. Like, is it a truly great movie? No. Would I watch it again for a couple of the fight scenes? But the jokes are one hit wonders and I'm done with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the battle scenes, I'm with you. And once again, this, uh, this movie has an ACDC song in it. So I'm good with it. And then the end credit scene fixes the only problem I had with the movie. <laughs> no, I did because it was like, they're trying to make like, we didn't mention it earlier when they go see Cassandra. Deadpool just says all this gar just this, this garbage talk about Cassandra and says it was human torture said it. And he's like, no, no, I swear. And she kills him in a gruesome, in a, in a totally practical effect where she rips his skin off and he bleeds into the thing. And then Deadpool shows the bit where he did say all that stuff. And I was like, that's good because you can't kill the human torch and be the redeemable character. Like, but Deadpool didn't say anything that wasn't true. So I'm okay with the movie at this point. Now, and again, like I said, fun, would watch it again, would recommend other people see it. Definitely. I don't love it the same way people, other people did. And maybe it's just because, and you know, listen, maybe comics have ruined me for everything. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the, and we'll, we'll close up shop here. And we're talking so much about this movie, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but it they get saved, the, it saved superhero movies. We have to go ahead. Right. So, uh, no, Robert Downey Jr. is Dr. Doom did. Oh, okay. So, we get the bit that the Wolverine that Deadpool chooses, um, he allowed the other X-Men to die. Mm-hmm. Right? He didn't want to join up with them. He left. And while he was gone, the human showed up and killed all the X-Men. And then Wolverine showed up and he killed all the humans. So he gets blamed for killing a bunch of humans. Mutants aren't, aren't like to begin with. So now he's like an outcast amongst outcasts, right? Mm-hmm. So then we get the bit later in the movie where Cassandra Nova does the finger wuju on him, right? Right. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, are they going to pull a fast one on us and have it revealed that 
Wolverine was lying about what happened. And what really happened was what happened in the comic Old Man Logan. Mm -hmm. If you remember what happened there. Yes, I remember. Okay. And they didn't. So I hyped that up a little bit in my own head. But I definitely feel as though, did the movie need it to be revealed that Wolverine was tricked into killing the X-Men as opposed to him letting the X-Men die? Right. At six to one, half a dozen the other. You know, it's still an emotional beat for the character in a moment. But because there was a moment in one of the best Wolverine comics ever where it's so close to what they do in the movie, Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be revealed that it was the old man Logan origin. Right. And then we didn't get it. I was kind of like, I let myself down because I hyped it up too much. I'll say this. I thought that's kind of where it was going to. Yeah. But I think they want to do a variant version of Wolverine where that happens, if that makes any sense. Like, they want to do an Old Man Logan movie proper, so they didn't want to give it away in the Deadpool 3 movie. All right, that makes sense. You know? When Hugh Jackman, I'm telling you, when Hugh Jackman does it at, I don't know, is he close to 68 yet? Uh, He's forever young. He looks good, but, you know, he's going to get there eventually. He's 55. He's the speed limit right now. So. Uh, But yeah, I like the movie. I recommend go see it. You'll enjoy it. You'll have a good time. You'll have a laugh. Go in. At this point, I'm assuming you've already seen the movie because we've spoiled pretty much everything. Yeah. And I will say, because I've had a few arguments with people that, not arguments, but discussions, where I feel that even though I love this movie, it's still my second favorite Deadpool. It goes one, three, and two for me. Okay. So if anybody wants to, you know, say your 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 love of the movies, I'd be fine with that. But it's one, three, and two for me. I think that's everything, though, Joe. I would certainly say that has to be everything. If it's yes. not everything, then we're doing something wrong. Right. It was a short show, but short-ish. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, this was episode seven hundred twenty-one of Longbox Heroes. For Todd, this is Joe saying, we'll catch y'all here next week. Remember, be a faucet, not a drain. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks. The Rob is a long box hero. The Rob is a long box hero. He gives us five five stars.